Good morning, everyone. I'm Tanisha Carino. I'm the executive director of Faster Cures at the Milken Institute. For those of you that don't know Faster Cures, we've been an organization for about 15 years. And we like to say that our name is our mission. What we get up every day that inspires us is the idea that we have 10,000 diseases and only 500 effective treatments and cures. And that's really the motivation that my team and the Milken Institute has to host discussions like this. So all of you in this room are quite familiar with the promise of Asia and the health needs in the, this region. But in particular, in getting ready for this discussion today, I wanted to really reflect on the gains that have already been made here in Asia in terms of life expectancy. So over the course of the last 100 years, the life expectancy here in the Asian region has increased by 43 years. So the investments that have already been made in public health interventions, the gains that have been made, vaccines, have really played an enormous role in creating a society and an economy that can flourish. And so today, what we're going to talk about is the importance of the investment and the expansion of the capacity here in Asia to really get to the next level of treatments and cures that we all need as, as human health. Um, and we have a tremendous panel that will really help us put a uh, focus on what do we mean by translational research and what does um, Asia need in terms of creating and really um, achieving the promise that it has. I want to just quickly begin with um, a, a basic definition of what do we mean by translational research. So translation in the broader R&D process is commonly broken up into three major phases. The first phase being the earliest phase of research, where scientists don't have the particular regard to the application or practical use of the research. They're looking at very basic questions around how different molecular uh, interplays, uh, biology, um, this is largely what you think about when folks think about that bench science. Then what translational research is, and our guests today will really talk about it, is this common phase where it's not basic research. And you're starting to get to how can the discoveries in basic research actually be applied to pragmatic issues that are facing us, and in particular for us from a health perspective. And then translational research and the gains out of translational research are what eventually creates um, potential innovations and that knowledge and the promise for translating what we see in that phase of translational research into clinical research and the testing that we do in humans to identify what types of interventions are really going to improve health. And so today with us, we have four incredible guests with very distinct perspectives of what's really needed in terms of capacity building. To my right is Carl Firth, who is the founder and CEO of Auslan Pharmaceuticals. And Auslan is actually located here in Singapore, and he's going to be our resident speaker on how to distill all these macro trends that we'll be talking about today for what we need here in this region. Annalisa Jenkins, to my left, is the president and CEO of Plactech Therapeutics, which is a leading cardiovascular liquid biopsy diagnostic company. Annalisa has been an R&D leader in both big and smaller companies and is, has a vast perspective of the broader industry and what's really needed from both a science but also commercialization perspective. And to Annalisa's left is our colleague from the United States, Beju Shaw, who's the chief executive officer of Biomotive and a co-leader in the Harrington Project, which you'll hear about today, which is a very unique organization that both focuses on creating a platform for management and also capital in terms of um, its application and translational research. And then to my furthest right is Chris Bardone, who is the managing director of the Oncology Impact Fund at MPM Capital. So thank you all for being here today. So I wanna just start us off with this notion of what is translational research. And before I do that, in the classic Milken Institute style, we have a quiz for you. <laughs> so I don't know how many of you all have had a chance to download the um, events app, but if you, if you do and you have that on hand, we have three questions to get us going in terms of the interactivity. And I really would encourage us to make sure that this session is interactive and we'll leave a significant amount of time at the end for a Q&A and a discussion. But maybe we can just go ahead and flash up the first question. All right. 
What percentage of total medical research funding in Singapore is dedicated to translational research? Hmm. For folks that have the device and would like to just cast your votes, why don't we do that now? And <laughs> we have one person, two people. Three people. Great, and then just because I know I'm challenged by apps, we're gonna do a quick also raising of the hands. <laughs> Who believes it's 15%? All right, how about 25%, 33%, 50%, and 66%. All right, so let's do the big reveal. The correct answer is, it should be 33%. Wow. Oh. So that is, and just for context, the National Institutes of Health in um, Washington in the United States, our biggest biomedical yeah. research funder, I believe only spends 20, mid 20% on translational yeah. research. So that's, that's quite impressive. Mm -hmm. Second question. According to recent projections, specifically by Credit Suisse, by what year will China pull ahead of the U.S. in the total R&D funding it provides yes. in absolute dollars? Let's just do a raise of hands. How many people <laughs> believe they have already surpassed the U.S.? How many believe it'll be in 2020? Yeah. 2035? Breaking even or other? Okay, so the correct answer is actually 2020. Okay. Hmm. And that estimate has been readjusted recently to be expedited by about five years. Um, great, and our last question. What Asian nation ranks the highest in terms of the number of researchers per capita? South Korea, China, Singapore, <laughs> <laughs> Japan, or India? Nobody wants to raise hands on this one? Okay. The, the correct answer is South Korea, actually. Wow. Oh, oh, interesting. Really? Great. Cool. Good. Great. So with that, I would love for the panel just be, to begin with, let's deconstruct a little bit more. What, what do we mean by translational research and what is its importance in terms of that broader phase of from basic to clinical research? I'd like to go first. Yeah, you know, I'm happy to uh, maybe kick things off. So, I, you know, I look at translational research as really the process by making science useful for patients. That's, that's it. And, what I find, um, certainly in the United States, is many people don't distinguish between what is academic science mm -hmm. and what can actually become useful for patients. And there's a whole process in between of taking scientific knowledge and then creating a drug product or a therapeutic that may be useful against that science that has the chance <coughs> of helping patients. To me, that's translational research. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe to add to that, I mean, I, I, the analogy I often use is if, if any of you guys actually believe in uh, reincarnation, then you want to come back as a mouse <laughs> because we have thousands of drugs that can cure cancer and mice. They just don't work in humans. <laughs> and the fundamental problem we have is that you can read, you know, the latest edition of I don't know if BBC or, or anyone like that is here right now, but if you, if you read you know, the report on, hey, this is a great new drug, just cures cancer and mice, that's great for the mouse, but really the challenge is how do we translate that into something that will have an effect on humans, and then how do we effect, uh, translate that into something that is gonna be relevant and will make patients wanna take the drug, will make doctors wanna prescribe the drug, and will make payers be willing to pay for the drug. Mm -hmm. And that's the key translation that has to take place. Mm -hmm. Annalisa, who typically does translational research? Is that something that the for-profit sector does? Who, who are the leading actors in translational research? Well, if um, we think about the goal of translational research, um, and I think uh, others have captured that, which is that, you know, answering the question, um, is this target and is this therapeutic approach uh, relevant to humans? Um, is it going to deliver a product profile that's meaningful and of value in the human setting? Um, and can we uh, really truly ultimately define the match between the target, the therapeutic, and the specific patient population 
it's clear actually that over the years the uh, uh, there's been a little bit of a shift in terms of who's funding and delivering that. So traditionally in the past, that was uniquely the remit of the industry, I would say. And I think you've seen over the last 15 to 20 years, increasingly, whether that be projects like the big NIH project, mm -hmm. um, so academics uh, working on translational research, and increasingly the role of patient associations and non-profits um, very successfully both funding and overseeing translational research. And for me, translational research is really that special period of time, which is about two years before you go into the clinic, mm -hmm. and hopefully two years after you've been in the clinic. Because really that four-year period generally um, is the time um, during which you have the opportunity to really truly understand if there are specific patients who ultimately will benefit. And I think that generally that can be achieved across the board by many different people working in the system. But I think that's one of the challenges of translational research is it's not well defined who should be doing it. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of our academic co colleagues may or may not necessarily be interested in doing that, quite honestly. I know that. And why is that, Chris? Well, you know, they're really trained as basic scientists. I'm on the board of the Harvard Medical School, and they always say that they're very interested in doing more translational research in terms of getting their science and technology to patients. But quite honestly, it's a very different skill set. You know, you really need to have access to chemical libraries so that you have probative molecules for your, met, for your, your target. You need to develop assays. You know, there's a lot of, I would say, industrial problems processes associated with drug development that, quite frankly, a basic science professor at, at Harvard or you know, somewhere here in a Singapore academic institution really may not be trained to do. I think on the other side, you have companies, but the requirements for starting a company have become more and more aggressive. They want more and more translational research already done before they're willing to write the first check. And so there's almost a little bit of a gap as to who's doing it, who should be paying for it. Yeah. And, uh, and how to do that. We actually, to address this gap, we, for example, recently started a partnership with the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where we actually have one of our partners work at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute to help their faculty members do translational research. The truth is they recognize that they don't know how to always translate their basic science research. And so to have someone who has a venture capital hat, who has access to generating uh, small compound libraries or antibody technology to help them to move their program forward has been a really great relationship. So, in Fast Recurs has done a tremendous amount of work on this idea of translational research. That's commonly people talk about it being this valley of death, and um, <laughs> that being really a reflection of how high risk this period of time is in the scientific process but also the real gap in appetite for traditional investors to get into this area. Mm. Um, Bijou, do you mind telling us a little sure. bit more about why did the Harrington Project really emerge and what is its goal? Sure, so the Harrington Project is a very unique initiative to address this Valley of Death challenge and to really bring academic science forward to the point where it's relevant for patients. Um, the structure is, is different in that there's a front-end not-for-profit funded by philanthropists, most notably the Harrington family, and a back-end that's a for-profit that's funded by impact investors and strategic uh, pharmaceutical partners. And the reason for, uh, for bringing it is really to address this, this gap that's occurred in our industry and has grown larger over time. So in spite of all sorts of heady um, uh, news articles today about the amount of money flowing into the biotech sector and wonderful exits that are occurring, the reality is, at least in the United States, it's very difficult for great academic science to find the resources to really move forward. And I think Chris said it really well, it's more than the money. It's really around the experience and the capabilities that only comes from careers on the industry side, whether it's in biotech or in large pharmaceutical companies, you need that as much as you need the money to actually move that science forward so that it can become useful for patients. Right. And philanthropists are a, a very important uh, source of the funding, but again, it's got to be more than the funding. It's really a whole platform that's required to support academic science to move it forward. Right. Well, well, Carl, you are our resident here in Singapore, and you know, it, when you look at the investor reports and the, the surveys that are being done, they, the investor perspective is very bullish in terms of this region and its possibility. What does it actually look and feel like from your perspective in terms of is the, is the 
focus really on basic science? What are we doing from a translational perspective here in Asia? Sure. So there's a couple of ways of, of looking at this. And, um, you know, the first perspective is a market perspective. And of course, you know, we all talk about China and when will China R&D overtake the U.S. The reality in terms of uh, pharmaceuticals is that whilst China is today the number two biggest market in the world, the component of that market that is actually made up by innovative medicines is still very small. And for many, many years to come, U.S. will still be by far the biggest component of that. And so a lot of the drivers in this part of the world, if all you're doing is focusing on some of your local markets, it's always going to be a little bit challenging to actually generate um, the value you need to justify the investment. In Aslan, one of the things that we've done is we focused on um, some of the diseases that are much more relevant for this region. So diseases like gastric cancer, cancer of the stomach, liver cancer, biliary tract cancer. And for us, when we look at you know, where, you know, where are the patients, Biliary tract cancer, for instance, there are about 12,000 patients in the U.S. In Asia, there are 200,000. It's a much more significant tumor type here. In northern Thailand, actually, it's the number one tumor type. Hmm. So, you know, when we think about how we develop for these, certainly it makes sense to do the development work. But when we think ultimately where should these drugs be, you know, how should they be taken to patients and where will those patients be, as much as they will be addressing, say, China and Japan, where these diseases are very common, we still need to address the unmet need in U.S. and Europe. And those markets will continue to be significant value drivers for, uh, for any commercial proposition. And so I think it's very important that we consider, you know, when we consider how we develop and, and, and take our drugs forward, we can't just focus purely on Asia. Looking back and in terms of what that's done historically, in Asia, because um, there's only recently been a, an awareness of the value that innovative medicines really bring, the focus has been, of course, on generics and branded generics. It's very natural. And so uh, in that context, it's only very recent we've seen these investments in innovation. And I'll give you one example for Singapore. Singapore started the experiments with drug development maybe I don't know, 15 plus years ago with investments in uh, organizations like ASTAR, the universities, uh, Biopolis, etc. It was all very much focused on basic research. And probably that was the right place to start. You bring in these scientists with these great CVs, you know, folks like Professor Sir David Lane and all these other um, you know, well-known individuals. And that's great. That's a great starting point. One of the challenges that Singapore and many other countries have had is they, it's taken them too long to realize they also need to build the next piece, the piece that will translate from that great science that's going on into something that's actually commercially relevant. Now there's an awareness of that. In the last five-year budget that the government announced for uh, research, innovation, and enterprise, $19 billion over a five-year period, the government has said very clearly, we need to make sure a lot of this money is aligned to investing in research that's aligned to commercial opportunities and translational uh, advancement. I want to go a little bit deeper there because one of the striking um, moves that I think Singapore has made in ASTAR is in changing the incentives within institutions that receive funding from ASTAR and this idea of scientists who are collaborating, particularly with, the, with, with for-profit organizations where collaboration is seen as raising the possibility that their work is gonna get translated, their time would get supported from a percentage of their core funding, more so than even people who may not be working in collaboration and that the publication expectations would get lowered. In, in the United States and probably in other countries, when you think about academic institutions and what they're incentivized for, these, in, these incentives really don't exist in that way. I mean, is, do you believe that that's really gonna change the behavior that we see and the, and the output that we get out of the, the process? Um, I, I think it will and I think it is. I think if you, um talk to a number of uh, pharma people who used to work in Asia, maybe Annalisa can comment on this yeah. as well. There are these stories that uh, you know, folks from Big Pharma came to uh, Singapore 15, 20 years ago. They did the tour of the research institutions and they came back to talk with the folks who wanted to make sure these companies would come here. And um, the feedback was, some very good science going on, but these scientists don't want to work with us <laughs> because they're so well funded already. There's no incentive <laughs> for these organizations to partner with us. So that historically was a big challenge because Singapore research has been very well funded. And so I think there was a... a it can look counterintuitive, right? But, but it's, you know, it, it, there's an absolute Crazy. need to yeah. say, we have to motivate you, we have to incentivize you um, to partner and to partner with industry. Otherwise, you know, I think to your earlier point, a lot of researchers are happy just to focus on their, you know, core area of science, mm -hmm. to publish, 
to get patents done, et cetera. And I think the other trend that we're seeing is historically, so I sit on the board of um, one of the groups in ASTAR responsible for sort of spin outs and commercializing assets from that organization. And you know, historically, the focus was very much on IP, on patents. File patents, get your, you know, your, um, your objectives for the year done. But now there's a recognition that just because you file a patent, it doesn't mean you're creating any value. So now the focus is on, well, what um, industry money have you brought in? What you know, licensing revenues? What co you know, commercial value are you actually creating as part of that? And I think that's a good balance to have. Yeah. I was going to say, but I think it's actually, we probably need a different person, honestly, doing it. It's not so much about incentivizing the basic science researcher to do translational research, because that's not what they want to do. They want to publish. That's what their career has been dedicated to. Right. And plus, as we mentioned, it's a whole different skill set, right? So right. I think the key is actually bringing back people with drug development experience, people who have done translational research in the setting of the industry, coming back to work with the academicians and then right. taking that next step in a different setting. Um, I think that's probably the better way to address it. Um, in that situation, I think maybe one of the bottlenecks may be having the right people mm -hmm. right. and the financing for that specific right. phase of the development. Yeah. Right. Perhaps I can That'd be comment great. on that. So I have the privilege these days, having worked for many years in large pharma, of um, working in um, starting companies and supporting companies, both in the east and, on the east and west coast of the US, the UK and Europe, and to a certain extent now in Asia. And it's fascinating to see um, the differences and perhaps some of the similarities. And so one of the differences um, speaks to this topic, which is that in the US, particularly if you're in Cambridge, Boston, you're in an ecosystem with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies. And so we always used to joke, you know, if you ever want a sort of minus 80 degree freezer, you, know, you could pick the phone up and have one delivered within about an hour because there's nothing you cannot get hold of. So infrastructure, talent, mm -hmm. you know, basically access to knowledge capital. and capital. Yeah? yeah. As you come a little bit more to the east, and certainly, you know, in Europe this is the case, um, it, you get on to this topic of, you, you know, do you have the right amount of capital and the quality of capital and access to the talent to be able to move out of that basic research. And I always say to people, I go into a lot of companies, um, at some point you have to get out of a mouse and you have to get into a human. <laughs> and it's interesting because that's really a big challenge for a lot of companies because actually you don't need a lot of capital. It's low risk right. to continue to conduct really fascinating research that you can publish. Um, it's, it's not really basic research, you know, it's sort of preclinical research. And it's really that leap to get into the first patient that's a real challenge. And uh, the reason that that is a real challenge is A, because it starts to cost more money, B, because it's a lot more risky, and C, because not many people have the confidence and the expertise to be able to do that. And so all of these dynamics create the need, I think, increasingly in hubs in, in this region, but it's also true in the Europe, hubs that require very uh, good collaborative networks. And that's what we're really talking about. The bringing together of the scientists and the, you know, that who are able to really become excited and understand their science, but really with people that have been there and done it as it relates to clinical drug development. And let's not also forget these days, one of the most important areas, which is the CMC and manufacturing aspects mm -hmm. right. of translational science. Because in the worlds that we live in today, cell therapies, gene therapies, really very sophisticated biologics, if you don't have access to expertise in the CMC and manufacturing part of this business, it's extremely difficult to translate into a human. Yeah. I, I really want to reflect on some of what you're saying, because when you think about where translational research has created, where there's been a lot of urgency in the US around translational research, a lot of it has been driven by very organized patients who see the, the benefit and see sort of the promise of what they're hearing in the news about these signals and basic research and think that in six months there's going to be something to the market and then find out very quickly that that's not the case. And yes. in fact, we don't even have the incentive structure to pull that basic science 
forward. Where are we in, in Asia relative to the organization of both philanthropy and the patient community to create that level of urgency? I, you know, the patient in comparison to, you know, U.S. and perhaps Europe, I think, you know, in Asia, in, and again, it varies a lot, of course, from country to country, there's still a perception that the, that the doctor is, you know, something, you know, holier than thou, someone that, you know, if the doctor tells you something, you do it, you take it, you don't question them. So I think the idea of patient advocacy in Asia is still at its very uh, early and, and nascent stages. Um, so I think it's probably going to be a while be sort of, before we sort of see that, before we see that moving on. And, and a lot of it is also, I think, due to, um, you know, awareness and education. I think in the U.S., people are much more educated about their health, about what they're taking, the implications. Um, of course, in the U.S., they get exposed to a lot of it on television. So it's, you know, it's in right. your face all the time. CNN seems to be nonstop pharmaceutical advertisements. But, you know, you come to, uh, to this part of the world and there is none of that. And so I think until patients are, you know, better educated, they understand their treatment options, they understand what else they could be doing, we're probably not going to see that much of it. Mm -hmm. I, I was just going to say that, um, you know, one of the biggest disruptive dynamics and changes going on in the last five to ten years, I guess, in, in our industry has been this concept of, well, two things. Firstly, the concept of patient-centric drug development. Mm -hmm. So really ensuring that the voice of the patient uh, is front and centre. Uh, when it comes to uh, working through product profiles, medical value propositions, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, uh, that we're all trying to pursue. The second is the concept of personalized medicine um, and this notion of really more a molecular basis and uh, sort of with very, very specific phenotypes matching your, your therapeutic approach. Uh, with patients and coming together, those two things are impossible to achieve without representation from patients. The only thing I would say, and perhaps we can speak to the oncology space because I think that's been very interesting, um, the concept has been one that's been around now for about 10 years, actually 10 to 15 years. Um, operationalizing that has been far more challenging because access to uh, informed patients mm -hmm. yep. has been challenging um, particularly in the bigger diseases. I think when you come to the rare diseases, right. there are far more patient groups, family groups, where you can get access um, to those, uh, those perspectives. And also just being able to tap into the patient populations. There's a remarkable uh, lack of data, real world data, registries. Um, I'm always amazed, actually, with some of these diseases, how little we do know about them and how little access to data that we actually do have historically. And that, therefore, makes it challenging when one is trying to pursue really sort of specific, targeted drug development. I think in the oncology space, you know, people have been taking a lead, um, obviously, in the rare disease space, in the genetic diseases. Um, obviously, you're seeing a lot of that. So it's not surprising, perhaps, that Asia you know, has been a little bit slower to get out of the gate on this. But we can perhaps talk later in the panel about it, the opportunity for it to catch up and perhaps overtake in some areas. Right, yeah. absolutely. But you, do you want to reflect on this idea of the patient dynamic and philanthropy a little bit more specifically in terms of how that changes the way you view translational research? And Well, I think it's, um, I can speak from the U.S. context, not from Asia, but I think the patient groups, whether they're disease foundations or patient associations, have been incredible at organizing not only their communities, but organizing the research that's being yeah. done across mm -hmm. the board so that there is awareness of where the field stands today and what the gaps are, right. and then putting in place the infrastructure to support the development of novel therapies for that particular disease, whether it's patient registries or other resources that make it easier for drug developers to continue to, uh, to bring their products forward. What, what's been interesting is I've been listening to the conversation. I think, Annalisa, you did a great job of sort of articulating the various elements of science that's required or scientific disciplines that are required to really translate academic science into something that's relevant for patients. And I think in many, for the lay individual, whether it's in the US or in Asia, you expect that this academic science is somehow gonna magically okay. make that leap and all of a sudden become useful beyond mice to humans. Right. Not realizing that there's all these disciplines that Annalisa just described that need to work in concert and in collaboration to actually make that and in an iterative process. This is not a sequential 
straight a linear approach for development. There's a lot of iteration between those various elements. And I think patient organizations do in the US, the ones that are most effective, um, play that role of constantly convening and catalyzing those types of collaborations among the resources in their field. Yeah. I mean, I think also the, um, these organizations are particularly important as we enter into a world where we realize that lung cancer is what, not one disease, but 50 different diseases, where we realize that uh, rarer tumor types like biliary tract cancer need to be treated quite differently. You know, if you are unfortunate enough to um, be diagnosed with lung cancer in the US, you go to see a specialist. More often than not, that specialist will be aware of at least the, you know, the, the, certainly the approved drugs and perhaps several of the key clinical trials going on. The problem is if you're diagnosed with a, a much rarer tumor type, say biliary tract cancer, one, you won't be able to find a specialist. Right. And even if you can find an oncologist, he will not be up to speed uh, necessarily on the disease. And of course, they can do their, their background reading. But the key for those patients is then to connect to these, uh, to these groups, these patient groups, uh, foundations. We work with one in, in cholangiocarcinoma. And it's incredibly helpful if, if you're you know, part of this patient population to be part of a group who's going through the same journey, to get that education, to understand the treatment options, to understand the clinical trials that are going on and who are the key experts in the area. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the other thing that the patient groups do, certainly for us, is they bring that sense of urgency. You know, Annalisa, you talked about sort of the, the, uh, the leap of, that's required to move beyond the mice models and into the humans and to have the courage to do that. Having the patient groups there, whether it's the families yeah. or the patients themselves, they bring that sense of urgency to push the work forward, perhaps not when all the answers are known, but because really the options are, are pretty poor for the patients. And I think that's important. There's a couple of things there in terms of the regulatory environment as well. So certainly um, in the US, and to a certain extent, I think in Europe and Australia, and I'm not so sure about more broadly across Asia, the patient associations and groups, um, along with organizations like Faster Cures, have been uh, very important in creating a sense of urgency around the evolution of regulatory science. Mm -hmm. Because for a lot of these new technologies, one of the biggest barriers really in the last 15 years for those of us trying to pursue you know, um, innovation and, and, and risky research um, in terms of um, risk from a probability of success point of view is that um, the regulations haven't always helped us, uh, whether that be the definition of um, efficacy endpoints, yeah. biomarkers, companion diagnostics, mm -hmm. all of that needs to come together, or the CMC side. So I think that there's been an enormous amount of progress and today there are, is an acceleration of progress in regulatory science perhaps in the US and Europe. And we had a, a little bit of a panel yesterday where we were hearing about the work that's going on here in Singapore and across the region mm -hmm. to try and ensure that the regulatory framework here was conducive and fit for purpose as it relates to this translational space, which is going to be very important. The other point I wanted to make, and perhaps we, we can talk about this, which is that, you know, the, um, as you're thinking about um, translational um, research, making sure, again, that you have access to the right um, data. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and that the data that you have is curated, it's accessible, it's, again, it's, it's really going to be helping you address the right questions. And we can talk a little bit more about that. I think is absolutely critical, and it's increasingly critical when we're thinking about this evolution to personalize medicine yeah. and again in the oncology space if you think about you know the cell therapies now um, which are very very specific and very mm, very right. tailored to individuals it's almost impossible to think through how you're going to develop the next wave of these personalized medicines for specific tumor types in specific patients unless we have access to data and right. again we're sitting in a country that's been at the leading edge of, of some of this work but I do worry that uh, in this region that there isn't enough investment going in to this space and that's where the investment needs to be because unless you have these insights and unless you can truly understand the unique specifics of your population, it's going to be very difficult right. to think through how you evolve novel therapeutics to d address the specific diseases in specific patients that exist in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, Chris, do you, do you, I would love your perspective yeah. on that. Like, yeah. as an investor, how are you thinking about the broader data environment? 
um, as it relates to whether or not it makes this region more more attractive or less attractive relative to investment. The data environment like being? The ability to amass large quantities of data and use that as part of the advantage for translational research, but also just the broader clinical trials infrastructure that needs to be created. I mean, I think that's a place where the Singapore government can yeah. play a very active role yeah. because obviously, Given the society, the kind of this, you know, the command and control nature, the access to the medical records, and the universality of that, you know, in the U.S. we have such a, I would say, hodgepodge of medical data systems, you know, electronic medical records that don't not enough speak to each other. It'll get us but there. then here in Singapore, <laughs> you can access every citizen's medical records. You can find those 12 patients with this specific type of leukemia who meet these clinical criteria who could participate in the clinical trial. So. I think that Singapore, um, in this type of site, I know that's an issue also in Taiwan, where I'm from, they have excellent medical records dating right. back 50 years. And so actually, that's a huge wealth of data that you could access to help and um, accelerate the clinical development process. It's also important, for example, in discussing natural history for some of these very rare diseases. We need to know how we, how we want to change the disease course, but sometimes it's not well known what the natural history of that disease may be. Access, again, to the medical records would be really important. So I think that could be one great place that Singapore could easily add value in terms of enabling a great clinical trial access. Also access to patients. If you have a single payer system and everyone kind of goes through the same system, that makes it a lot easier. Um, also setting up and enabling clinical trial sites and access to clinical trial product. I mean, you know, there's no reason why Singapore shouldn't be one of the, you know, first and most, and most open clinical trial accessibility sites in Asia. And, you know, maybe just to yeah. add a comment to that, because it's a topic very close to my heart. Um, I mean, first of all, just to, to, to share one perspective in that, you know, when we talk about precision medicine, one of the big, you know, um, exciting sets of projects going on around the world is, you know, mapping <laughs> genomes and combining that with patient data, with history, et cetera, and trying to put it all together. And there's a lot of projects in different countries trying to do this. In the U.S., you have a project, and their goal is to try and do a million patients, a million people. All of us. All of us. You have, I think uh, in China, when they hear a million, they're like, yeah, yeah. Well, well, this, is, this is the thing. This is the thing. So, so first of all, Singapore also has a project that's now being discussed, and it's yeah. gone to a relatively advanced stage, and they're also targeting a million. I know the population is only five or six million. <laughs> right. So that shows you I the ambitions think Singapore of Singapore. I actually think Singapore will probably get there faster than even right. we might. I, quite possibly. But, but China, and of course, these are pro projects are still being discussed. But China's aspiration is a hundred million. Right. Wow. And of course, you could imagine that perhaps in a place like China, they probably can do that and they right. probably can achieve it. So I think that's going to tell us a lot. If, if indeed these these uh, countries can deliver on these sorts of things, right. and you know, frankly speaking, if you're talking about these sort of projects, you just have to look at some of the road systems in Singapore. Singapore, if it sets its mind to something, it will deliver it. Yeah. And that is going to tell us a lot about where these data sets are going to be in the future and how we can yeah. how we can best access them. Yeah. I think when we used to think about the infrastructure that we need for translational research, we always identified the, the importance of a leading scientific academic community. Um, we've become more hip to the idea of different kinds of capital that need to be there. But now this discussion about data and the data assets is, in my opinion, a whole new level of infrastructure mm -hmm. discussion that um, I think we're just starting to understand of how do you blend traditional clinical data and molecular data and everyday life living data to create a, a more holistic picture of the patient. Uh, I want to comment on something that you said, you know, which is really interesting to me. So uh, one of the things that you've talked about is that even though you're focused on these cancers that are prevalent here in Asia, because of the pull of the commercial market in the U.S. or in Europe, that by and large has really dictated what actually gets focused on from an R&D or translational research perspective. Um, when we have conversations about translational research, somebody stops us and says, you know what, unless a country in a region is ready to expand access and make health care a priority in health, then you're not going to ever realize the capacity that that region is going to have to address the things that are actually important to the people in that region. Now, do you really believe that that's the case? Do you, where, where do you feel like we are in tying together the priority around health in the Asian region with the, its priority as an R&D and an economic driver 
Well, I, I, I think that a lot of countries uh, in this part of the world will still struggle just because of you know, the ability to pay for medicines. When you look at countries like China and, of course, India, given the populations, again, the, 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 the cost, if you start having high degrees of innovation coming in in the marketplace, and I think countries are always going to struggle, and then that then begs the question, well, where should that research money be directed? Now, Annalisa brought up the, uh, you know, precision medicine earlier on, which I think is, of course, um, you know, pertinent to almost everything we do in oncology nowadays. But when we think about how we can apply that in the context of Asia, and we think about how do we identify you know, a group of patients that we, we are sure and are confident will respond to our drug, following that paradigm in Asia is, is challenging because you're talking about going from, you, know, you start out with um, 600,000 gastric cancer patients in China, and you identify a very small subset of maybe 10,000 patients. You know they'll respond well to your drug. But to be able to justify the investment in developing that drug, the sort of price you have to charge for that drug is going to make it unaffordable, certainly in a, in a market like China. And you know, just to give you the comparisons, if you look at a novel oncology drug, say, in the US targeting a very narrow patient population, prices are possibly around fifteen to $20,000 a month. The most expensive oncology drug that, that is you know, going to reach any number of patients in China is going to be capped at about $3,000 US dollars a month in China. So there's a huge disparity in prices for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. And I think that's always going to make it a challenge when we're talking about, say, precision medicine. And when the government is trying to say, well, how do we allocate our budget? Do we allocate you know, quite a big pot of money to pay for this really great new drug, but it's only targeting 10,000 patients? Or this other you know, cheaper, maybe less innovative drug that maybe we don't quite know who'd hit? Many governments will choose the latter. I think that, that, that it's a very philosophical question around whether um, countries or regions view biomedical research as the source of economic development, jobs, economy, right. versus a solution to their healthcare problems. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know we've seen over the years that there are countries and regions that have taken the view that this is an economic investment. So uh, actually, the UK actually is a very good example. Um, you know, we've got this little thing called Brexit coming up. Don't want to talk about that. Can go to a panel on that later. But um, you know, the uh, government very much realised that beyond financial services, the second pillar of the industrial strategy would have to be life science, tech, innovation, and they put an enormous amount of money behind that. I think you're all familiar with the fact that we are a country that has one of the worst records in terms of accessing new drugs, particularly in the cancer space, because mm -hmm. we have something called NICE, which is not very nice, um, mm -hmm. and that constricts <laughs> access to patients. So that's a good example of a society which is basically viewing innovation, right. investment in translational research, which today is largely funded by the government, because right. it's very, very difficult to get access to other forms of capital at the moment, um, very disconnected from its um, very disconnected, but somewhat disconnected from its health stuff. So I think in Asia, I think the point you're making, the question becomes, is investment in biomedical research, health life science and translational research viewed as an economic development priority right. versus is it something that we feel is, is going to be there to you know, address the public health and the major health issues that we also face as a society. One hopes there is a degree of overlap, yes. but I don't know that there needs to be complete overlap because I think yeah. building jobs, economy, and economic development is a virtuous cycle anyway in and of itself, and hopefully right. that money can be used to invest in improving the sort of general health of populations. Right. Yeah. Well, well, I was going to okay. mention that, you know, if you, I always think of um, as an investor, uh, it's not just a question of how much money you get out of the market, but how much money you need to put in to get to that point. Mm. And one of the, and I think that actually might be improving here in China and Asia in terms of how much you need to put in by the regulatory reforms that are happening in right. the Chinese FDA. I think that could dramatically change what the equation is in terms of whether the Chinese market is worthwhile or not. Right. You know, right now they have requirements which essentially require you to duplicate everything that you've done in Europe and the U.S. again, and as well without fixed timelines. You know, you could submit an application and not know when, you, if ever, you'll ever get feedback. And so really um, streamlining that regulatory progress, the way we did it with the PDUFA in the U.S. FDA, 
really it could transform that entire process so that if companies right. so know they only need 18 months to get this done, if they know that the, if a drug's approved in the U.S., that they only need this level of clinical trial to get it approved in China, that could change the whole equation right. so that you don't need U.S. pricing to justify the market in China. If I only need to make a minimal investment, I can still make a great return. Right. Well, I mean, uh, Go maybe ahead, just Carl. a comment on that because I think it's uh, for me, it's it's a trend that we've been watching very, very closely. What's been going on in China, and there have been a slew of regulatory changes over the last 12 to 18 months. Right. I've, I've been in Asia for 14 years, never seen anything like this, mm. and the numbers are bearing it out. If you look at the number of yeah. drug approvals of innovative drugs in China in right. 2014, there were four or five drugs. 2015, the same. 2016, the same. 2017, after the reforms came out, the number of innovative drugs approved yeah. went up to 40. Yeah. Wow. And almost all of them were imported drugs. Yeah. Right. They leveled the playing field. They said, yes, you can use your imported right. data. No, you don't have to do local manufacturing. And we're going to take our IND approval timelines down from what had been 18 months down to two right. months. So they, they, they've exactly. introduced a lot of changes, and that, I think, is making a huge difference. Yeah. And, you know, China already was a bit of a powerhouse in terms of uh, pharmaceutical innovation. But I think now right. we do see the next, yeah. the, the next few steps. Take. It is interesting, and for those of you that don't watch the sector very closely, AstraZeneca in March actually received a Chinese approval for its lung cancer drug mm -hmm. only 15 months after it had received FDA approval. Yeah. That is a record. It used to be decades, <laughs> to Chris's point. And, and what I'm really reflecting on is that you can change a whole regulatory process, but just because it's available in China doesn't necessarily mean that anyone has access. So you can be approved, but this idea of access and whether or not a country can both be a leader from an economic perspective in biomedical research, but not have it be contributing to its human health priorities is is, is really an interesting dilemma. And I think it makes it more interesting because what we're really all competing for at the end of the day is actually human talent. So if you want human talent to be in these countries working on the most cutting edge innovation, I have a hard time believing that you're gonna be able to compete for that talent and not actually create a system where they can get access to those, those medicines. One, one point I perhaps would maybe even dis disagree with you a little bit there, is I actually think we are, we are actually seeing the, the evolution of access to medicine as well. And you know, perhaps more closely watched in, uh, than these regulatory reforms in China were changes to the reimbursement scheme. Mm -hmm. yes. So you know, it was always the case in China, you had to wait years before you could potentially get onto the national reimbursement list. It was meant to be updated every two years, but you know, the last two updates, it was eight years apart. <laughs> and so you'd launch your drug and maybe eight years later, it would be reimbursed. They started recently to talk about changing that. Mm -hmm. They even went so far as to some people speculated about a rolling update that as soon as you got your drug approval, it might be considered for reimbursement. No one believed it. <laughs> and then about a month ago, they announced a whole set of drugs that had just been approved, most notably Keytruda, mm. um, which was you know, suddenly put forward for national reimbursement. And sorry, I think it was Opdivo actually, one of, the, one of the two. And they negotiated the price, price cut in half, which is you sort of expect it when you got into the national reimbursement list. But it had just been approved and now it's reimbursed yeah. in the marketplace. So I do think the, even the access to medicine yeah. is starting to change. I think that's, that's a really great point. And to Carl, to the point Carl is making is that the industry has to make maybe large price concessions, but the volume that can be delivered is enormous. And so even that trade-off between a unit price concession and volume is still achieving great gains for for the sales lines for most of these companies. I want to um, allow the audience in our last five minutes to ask any questions of our panelists. You guys have been great this morning. Please go ahead. So, um, really interesting comment you had uh, about the Singapore, uh, I guess, societal structure and an ability to start to get data mm -hmm. in, a, in a more regulated, holistic manner. It's an interesting conundrum. Everyone sees the China get this massive sample set anyone using data knows that it's not uh, structured mm -hmm. and uh, really properly uh, curated, it's irrelevant. So your comments uh, on Singapore is really, really interesting. I'm curious throughout to you all, we kind of wand in the second half of the discussion, but in the first half, whenever you mention data, everyone's head up and down, uh, really excited. And, and an observation that throw it out to you all is it seems to be a, a kind of a divide in many industries, but most in, in healthcare, um, of the data science expertise. It's mm -hmm. almost as if, oh. I'm curious if you all uh, have a different read, 
the expertise in chemistry and biology as a science in healthcare seems like there's an undertone of conflict between hiring and employing computer science mm -hmm. uh, skill sets within that and put them at odds, and yet it seems to me the next five or 10 years, you all seem to imply the most disruptive technology we're seeing will be data, sequence, yes. data sequencing uh, and the like. So I guess one is what's your read? You're, you're a fairly diverse panel, which is great. Um, what's your read on that divide? Am I, am, am I, is my impression incorrect? Right. Is it polarized? Like what kind of future workforce mix are we going to see with yeah. data science versus what? the traditional? Well, and, and two is who are you seeing doing anything in Asia as mm -hmm. relates to uh, really um, <laughs> uh, advanced sequencing using computer science, really uh, you know the data science efforts. Who's doing that right now globally yeah. in, in Pan Asia? Mm -hmm. Curious, so we can watch and monitor and see. It seems to me it's mostly uh, leveraging distribution vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. Asian companies. Uh, mm -hmm. so, but maybe I'm wrong. I'd love yeah. your take yeah. on all that. It's a lot there. So, uh, may, may Jim, Carl, go ahead, Carl. Carl you, you want to go first? Well, I'll, I'll start maybe on the first part of that question. I can't speak to the second one, but I think your observation is very interesting, and I'll just reflect on sort of our own company. Um, we focus on preclinical drug development, not so much on the clinical side, but even in the preclinical space, there's this new sort of movement of trying to bring data in using AI-enabled techniques to do better drug design, better drug development, more efficient. It's amazing the amount of skepticism that my team members have. And I think it's in part driven by, you know, we've been hearing about this for 20 years. You know, the right. in silico drug development revolution was back in the mid-1990s. It was being pioneered, and it never really panned out when you actually started to, you know, take those in silico drugs and start to put them through the paces that are required to bring those drugs all the way forward for patients. So I think your observation about that kind of that cultural gap inside of at least traditional uh, industry still exists. Um, from an investment perspective, we're very interested. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that can make drug development more efficient um, is something that we need to. To Chris's comments about, you know, it's about how much money you put in as well as how much you might earn. We think that there's promise and we're certainly running experiments in, in collaboration with some of our partners to use AI-enabled drug discovery to see if we can finally bring mm -hmm. the benefits of all that big data into the front end of drug development. Mm -hmm. So I, I would, I always said I would, I would mix this up a little bit and I'd have, have to disagree. So um, <laughs> my, 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 I've got a PhD in computational biology. I joined AstraZeneca <laughs> in 98 as a bioinformatics scientist. Back then I was running a team of about 30 people across multiple sites and all we did was look at data. We worked side by side with the scientists and we just kept on growing. Obviously that was the time when the human genome did come out. Yeah, right. And it, what happened, whilst you know, some of those, the, the way that we focus bioinformatics and informatics generally sort of changed, what happened is it became absorbed into the DNA of how these companies do research. So from the perspective of how we use data to determine drug targets, to do validation, how we do chemical screening, how we optimize those chemicals, it's all about data. So that is all, that's just intrinsic. Every single drug that gets approved today, it's been touched by informatics, by data analytics. I think what we're seeing today is a little bit different in that there are a number of other newer techniques that relate much more to real world data, which is not something that we had access to in the past. And it's how we integrate that real world data with what we're doing that I think is a big challenge. And I think in that respect, I would agree that there is a cultural gap. Pharma companies are sort of big elephants. It's one of the reasons why after 10 years at AstraZeneca, I decided to, to leave and do a, do a startup. It, 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 there is a certain culture inside and I think thinking about how we move forwards with this real world data, I think the pharma companies are not going to be the ones to do it. Yeah. It's going to be the Google or the Verily. It's going to be the people who are actually gathering this data. And you don't have those cultural um, issues around the quality of real world data and their skepticism. Exactly. And in Asia, to your question, companies like BGI, um, there are a small number of other companies, not as many as you would obviously find on the West Coast, but they do exist. I mean, that's the big question. Who is who is going to aggregate the data and pay for it, right? And so I think, for example, in the question of sequencing, you know, even the NIH didn't aggregate um, a lot of cancer genomes. It was actually the companies who have been doing the sequencing right. who have done the aggregation and now sit on them. And they actually have tremendous commercial value. So. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, um, is it the government here in Singapore that's going to do it? Is it going to be the providers of different services? Um, and who's going to be able to access that? I think those are the big yeah. questions. Uh, we can take one more question, and I think we're going to have to wrap up. But Dean Goldman. 
does actually use Epic, which is a U.S. system, yes. but far better way than we do. They just do it right. Yeah, they do it right. <laughs> Yes. The that we're to use. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Not because there are bad people in the system. Right. There's no emphasis on the quality of those data, and all right. you have to do is look at your own or put up to you yeah. your own medical records online, <laughs> and you can see every time you've talked about a hangnail, it's listed there. It's like you've got this problem list that you won't believe, and all kinds of things in it that are not correct. Right. You can, right. You can, right. You can validate that for yourself because the incentives in the system have not been around the quality of those mm -hmm. data. That's not what their purpose was. And I think that it's it's not a matter of having the, the informaticists. I think it's absolutely right. The companies have them. We have them in the universities. We work side by side with them. But you know, the old expression of garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. It's really the truth. And you know, be you know, we have to be truthful about the fact that if we're gonna take advantage of this opportunity, yeah. we have to get right down to the level where the data are collected and aggregated yeah. and made mm -hmm. better. Well, I, I appreciate the discussion and the interaction that this, um, that this audience has had with the panel. I want to thank you all today for allowing us to have this discussion. It's one of, the, the, one of maybe three healthcare discussions that we're having. So I'll, I'll, I appreciate the interest in the health um, portfolio of the Milken Institute and hope that you interact with us throughout the year. So thank you. Thanks.